Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Barbara Burns, and I am one of the artists at Markings Gallery in Bath on Front Street, 50 Front Street, across the street from the cooking store. And there it is. Um, the gallery is an artist cooperative, and we have three rooms full of quite an eclectic mix of work from accomplished main artists. It includes metal, clay, fiber, glass, paint, stone, wood. And um, the, the gallery has been open for over 10 years. We had our anniversary in the year of COVID, our 10 year anniversary. And um, it's a great place to shop and find gifts and bring friends to. And we like to be a part of the community. And if you may have been to one of our artist talks pre-COVID, or maybe you came to our fashion show um, a couple of years ago that we did with the lingerie store down the street. But we really do like to engage with the community. So these artist talks are part of that. And the talks will be available to be viewed online, both through the library and through uh, Markings Gallery's website. And we, with COVID, we built a phenomenal website. So if you want to shop online or use a personal shopper, Wayne is our personal shopper. So you can connect with Wayne and, and he will take, take you for a walk through the gallery and shop. Um, so Wayne will be our first speaker and Wayne has been sculpting sea creatures for more than 45 years. His personal knowledge of marine life and birds allows him to gracefully recreate them from wood sustainably harvested here in Maine. Having been a biology and anatomy teacher since graduation from college, Wayne has incorporated anatomical accuracy and realistic poses in his work. His work is all over the world in private collections and museums. And um, take it away, Wayne. Well, thank you, Barbara. And uh, this is indeed a, a strange new way for me to contact the public. I have not done this before. And I'm used to talking because I've been a teacher for 50 years, but when I'm doing something like this, talking to a screen, I'm not exactly sure how it's gonna come out. So I'll just kind of start with um, a little bit of a history of mine. I started carving, I guess I can claim, in Cub Scouts with soap carving. I was not really successful. I think my frog broke. And um, then in Boy Scouts, I did a number of projects and got um, wood carving merit badge. And, and I really have to answer a lot of questions when people see me carving. And uh, I thought maybe I'd run through some of these questions um, kind of in sequence here and, and see if it, uh, if it works. Um, I did start when I was uh, somewhere around seven, I guess. And since I'm 78, I probably have been carving more than 45 years, but I don't dare to change the number on my ads. People will think I'm senile and, and uh, think I'm not probably doing it right. But anyway, <laughs> um, I did kind of get a, a little boost in the carving area by um, watching a pair of old timers sitting on the end of the wharf at Sabasco, and they would take a piece of broken fish box. In those days, the fish were kept in ice in pine boxes to be transported to the market. And they get hit by the shovel or banged into each other and the boxes got broken. And these old guys would sit there and tell each other stories and um, carve the little plugs that um, we used to use to, to jam in the claws of lobsters so they couldn't bite. And the tourists would come down there and they would be fascinated by these two old guys. 
Mel and Mose Wallace. And um, it was just fun watching those little curls come off the blade. And, and I got a jackknife and I carried it forever and I sharpened it just like the guy that used to prepare fish on the wharf. And um, I got it reasonably sharp. And I progressed from the little plugs, the wedges, to carving lobster buoys. And I used to grab uh, pine out of the kindling box in the, in the camp. And then I would paint them with airplane dope in the colors of my lobster buoys because I, I had my own lobster traps from the age of, I think it was nine, but I, yeah, I think it was nine. And I used them as trade items when I went to uh, Boy Scout camperies and things. And I carved the little projects that were in Boy's Life magazine, like neckerchief slides, which were um, pretty simple things like a trout that you stuck the neckerchief slide down through the mouth and out through the gills and, and uh, all, all kinds of little things like that, just having fun. And uh, when I... Uh, when I was in uh, college, in, in junior high in college, I did a couple of projects. The seventh grade, I carved the boat that I used to work on. I called it work, but I probably was in the way more than I was a helper. Um, a fishing boat that was a dragger. And uh, then I carved things for my science project in the ninth grade. And, and in college, I carved amoebas and things like that. But um, I wasn't doing a lot of serious carving. A lot of it was just, I would have to say, um, amusement carving, amuse myself and amuse other people. Uh, when I was in the service, I got stationed back in Fort Devens, Massachusetts, my last year. And uh, I was pretty darn sure I did not want to go back to flying helicopters again in Vietnam. So I knew that I was going to get out and at that time, my wife was quite ill. And in the evenings, we'd sit and watch television and I would carve again from the wood box. And I carved gulls and looms and boats and lighthouses and painted them with my airplane dopes. And I had quite a shoebox full of stuff. And um, I gave them away to friends and, and my folks and, and uh, still using my jackknife. When, uh, when I was in graduate school, I was carving during one of my lunch breaks on a little tiny piece of pine that I had in my pocket. And one of my fellow classmates asked if I would bring in some things that I had finished. So I had some chickadees and, and some little fish and I took them in and doggone they sold. And boy, well, I'll tell you, that hooked me. So in 1972, one, 71, 1971, I actually sold my first carving. And from then on, um, I was carving primarily birds and the tools that I used were jackknives. And I have since progressed to a little more sophisticated knives and, and gouges and things like that. This screen shows what I'm using presently most of the time. And even though I have the ability and the equipment to power carve, I still can't um, justify the noise and the dust that I, and I just enjoy making those little curls. And I have progressed from pine from the wood box. You wanna be to, selling stuff that I power carved. <laughs> Oh, I'm getting feedback here. All right, I'm, I'll progress again. Um, I've progressed to a lot of uh, native basswood or linden and a lot of butternut, but I'm not above carving donations such as cutoffs from people's projects with mahogany and cherry and, and maple and walnut. And I love those woods, but the harder woods are becoming harder to carve for me because I've got a little bit of arthritis going in my, in my uh, hands. 
and it's forced me to have one hand operated on. Um, so I've gotten rid of one of my aching hands, and now I've just got one left to, that uh, may have to do something about shortly. But we'll keep going as long as we can. I know if I stop carving, that's it. I probably would never be able to go back. Now, when I first started selling things, like I joined the cooperative called Yankee Artisan Bath, I was carving primarily birds. Next slide, please. Oh, I forgot. I, <laughs> these are the buoys that I did carve back in the 50s. And uh, some of them got painted and some didn't. And uh, the green and yellow one in the middle is one that I carved very early because I didn't know how to do the spindle, the, the stick sticking out of the end. So I would make a hole and put a match stick in it. And uh, then I progressed to fancier buoys. Next slide, please. These are two Boy Scout projects, the lobster and, and the fawn. And uh, the reason I have these is they were part of my mother's collection on the windowsill at the camp at Sabasco. And when they passed and we had to empty the cottage, I got them back and uh, I use them for props when I'm teaching sometimes. Next slide, please. That's the boat I carved in the seventh grade out of a piece of two by four. And that's spruce, not pine. And it was a lot harder to carve than the, the pine. <laughs> And the rigging has since deteriorated. I don't, uh, I don't have the yarn of the uh, thread on it for the rigging. I probably should put it back, but I haven't done that. So next slide, please. These are the little birds that I painted with my airplane dope. And uh, you can see not a lot of finesse and skill, but a lot of fun. Next, please. I was very interested in insects when I was in college and I had quite an extensive collection of, of bugs that I had preserved. And I had even done quite a bit of collecting when I was in flight school in Texas and Alabama. And I had some beauties from Vietnam. And so I started carving bugs and using uh, pipe cleaners for legs and those were fun. And uh, Next slide, please. Those did not sell, by the way. I still probably have all of those. When I did start selling, I started with a little wall mount design that were whales and birds and things that were about six to 10 inches long, stained, and uh, I could sell them for $10 and, and pay the commission and, and justify my, uh, my time expenditure. Next slide, please. A long time ago. I have now probably done of the 86 odd species of cetaceans, I've done about 55 of them. And one of the things that uh, I learned from Chippy Chase and Hank Tyler, two carvers from Brunswick, is that everything should be numbered, named, and um, the date put on the back of them. And so I've been doing that since the 70s. And I looked at um, my book yesterday when I engraved one of my recent pieces and I'm just under 5,200 pieces that I've carved in the last years, <laughs> however many years it is. Wow. Wow. So. I, um, I have a few people that have started collections and they, they have um, 20 or 30 of these little guys on the wall. And now I don't just do whales, I do sharks and seals and sea lions. And I've done a sea otters and, and things, but a lot of my things are kind of thematic. It, I'm really, in love with the sea. I don't want to go to sea. I just love the sea and love the animals and, and the birds and things. So that's what I'm, I'm doing. Next slide, please. 
I have a gallery here at the house and um, we took over one bay of the garage and, and had it insulated and heated and shelves put in. And uh, I've got the shelves full right now. I'm actually having to put stuff in drawers because I don't have enough shelf space. Last year was not a great year for sales for whales, but you can see um, I really did uh, kind of pick up on the whale theme somewhere in the mid middle 70s when we, we had a, um, a program at the school and we were watching for strandings and we had a whole crew that lived down in Five Islands and Georgetown and, and everything waiting for whales to come ashore so we could notify a professor at the University of Maine Farmington to come down and take parts to send to Smithsonian. Because in the 70s, there was very little known about whales. And so they were basically um, just uh, mobile oil factories until we started really studying the whales. Next slide, please. Mm. I have um, a lot of single sculptures, a few multiple sculptures. Next slide. A lot of birds, mostly, mostly seabirds, puffins, ox, gannets, and uh, ducks and, and uh, uh, sandpipers and things like that. I, next slide, please. I kind of say when people ask me, uh, the smallest one I've ever made was about an inch and a half long. And the biggest was just under 50 inches long. And this whale in the center of the pegboard here is, is over four, uh, about four feet long. And um, one of the little things oh, that 50 I inches, then. have incorporated with um, my sperm whales is I've been taking scraps from a, a scrimshanda and grinding them to make teeth and eyes. So I have to be careful who I say that to because some purists uh, don't like the idea that I'm using um, real whale parts to augment my carvings. Next slide, please. Everybody's favorite bird around here is seabird is a puffin. And I don't know how many I've carved, but I, if I have a, a, a show a live show where I'm trying to show people a little bit about carving, I usually end up carving the puffin. Next one, please. I always have a few that love owls. And uh, so I do a few owls. Next. Songbirds. I do a, f a number of songbirds. Chickadees, nuthatches, brown creepers. That's a brown creeper. Um, and they're fairly easy and they're much less expensive than the, the more complicated whales. Next, please. That's a nice piece of, of hardwood. I love doing black walnut, but I have to wait for pieces to fall my way. I, I really don't go out and try to buy them. Next, please. I've, I really got a kick out of the um, series that Walt Disney did on the Vanishing Prairie. And they did a series of the Western Greaves. Oh, uh, dancers? Flying across the top of water uh, with, with their feet and their wings spread and their necks craned. So I've done a number of the Western Greaves. Next, please. Um, I'm doing a theme kind of um, approach to whales now. When, uh, when we first started appreciating whales, um, I guess you'd have to say, we could only really appreciate them when they were dead. We never got to see them. They were pretty elusive. Um, nowadays, they're very common. And this is a, a, a little 
scene that I had seen on television where a pair of kayakers were out observing whales, uh, abiding by the 500 foot limit. They're not allowed to approach whales within 500 feet, but the whales don't have a very good um, tape measure. This particular whale came up and actually breached over the two kayakers and um, they did not get hurt. And uh, there was a special on TV about it. And the guy and his girlfriend in the kayak tried to identify the whale. They spent about a year trying to track down people that took photos that day. And uh, because of the signature pattern on the underside of the fluke, they found out which whale it was. And next one, please. That's one encounter. Here's another encounter also uh, taken from recent publicity, um, whales getting entangled in fishing gear. This is a humpback entangled in a net. And uh, I did only half of the whale trying to get the, get the point across that uh, once they get that around them, there's no way they can get out of it. Their instinct is to spin. And when they do, they just wrap themselves up. Next, please. There have been uh, people that were whale watching that uh, got in the middle of a bubble net. Whales blow bubbles underwater to corral their bait fish into um, a big mouthful. And then they come up through the bottom of that, uh, that little pool of fish. They can't see what's ahead of them. And this couple in a kayak just happened to be in the middle of where the fish were and they got a, a ride they'll never forget. The whale, of course, cannot swallow a person. The, the uh, esophagus is too small to accommodate a human, but they sure can raise heck with a boat. Next, please. When you read the old chronicles of whalers and whaling, this was a common scene with sperm whales they would uh, get uh, injured and they would lash out at the boats. And this is a whale boat being crushed in the jaws of a sperm whale. And uh, next one, please. Wayne, I'm just gonna give you a four minute warning. Okay, yep. Um, I try to do a little bit of biology education with my art too. And, this is a picture of a sperm whale with one of their primary uh, prey species, a squid in its mouth. Next, please. Um, we are so, I'm gonna say egocentric. We think that we have exclusive rights to feelings and, and emotions and things. Um, whales are proving that very wrong. And this is a picture of a whale instinctively pushing a baby to the surface for its first breath because uh, they are air breathers. And if the baby is not really robust, they don't swim to the surface. The mother or what they call a nurse will force the baby to the surface. If the baby is a stillborn, they've been known to push the baby with their nose around until it completely decomposes. Next, please. This is a right whale that's been hit by propellers. These guys are slow and we kind of give them very little intellectual capacity and uh, they just can't judge a boat and uh, they get racked by propellers and get hit by bows and things. It's, we, we're really devastating this very limited population. Next, please. We have a, a photograph of a whale actually saving a seal down in Antarctica from orcas. Orcas were chasing this guy. The humpback picked it up and kept it on its belly. It's upside down until the orca lost interest. And next one, please. There's a, another thing that um, the biology of whales 
people don't even think about. And this is a California gray whale called a mussel digger that digs a trench to get um, uh, creatures out of the mud for its food. Next, please. Is there one more? Okay, that's the end. Um, I have I have another very strange one of a river dolphin that swims on its side. It's blind, and it um, it feeds almost exclusively by swimming sideways in the Ganges River and places like that. Well, um, whales are my passion, I guess, and education is my attempt to uh, bring the message of um, ecology to the ocean. And I thank you very much and hope you have some questions that I've neglected to think of in advance. Thank you, Wayne, that was great. I had no idea, I have, there's a lot of your work I haven't seen that doesn't make it to the gallery. Those are beautiful. Um, just a reminder to mute if you're not sure, if you don't see a little red microphone in the bottom left corner of the box with your name in it, then you're not muted. So please mute. If you're on a computer, it'll be on the bottom left. If you're on an iPad, I think it's the top right. Thank you. So we have, um, next we have Susie Perrine. And Susie constructs introspective textiles ranging from handheld, wearable, to inhabitable. Works may include paper, horsehair, or twigs. Beginning as a weaving apprentice, Susie later learned to use water and electric power powdered jacquard and dobby looms, which are quite complex. Currently, her seven foot tall woven twig garden lamp is in the window at Markings Gallery. If you come down to the gallery, you will see a window with Susie's twig lamps and they're really wonderful. Susie, if you oh, can share your screen. All right, okay, yeah, thanks Barbara. And thank you people for joining us during dinner hour. Let's see if I can just play this. There we go, can you see it? Oh, now I can't hear anyone. It's not up yet, Susie. Okay, let's see. How do I share this to Zoom? At the bottom. Here we go. Me. There you go. There's my desk and oopsie. Well, I had a nice intro slide, but I don't think I can back up. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Let me try that. Anyway, I'll just keep going forward. I do a lot of dyeing and uh, you're looking into a stainless steel bowl here on the left. Um, and I'm doing a dyeing technique to, to let some of the materials get dyed and some not. So on the right, you see the different vari variations in the dye pot. I know I can go forward. So this um, are some of the results of some of my weavings. Uh, I usually use plain weave, which is the most simple weaving. Um, the piece with the yellow on the left is, has twill. The middle one is a resist dye technique. I'll talk more about that. And then uh, that's cotton. And then on the right is main alpaca. Uh, another technique I, I use, I'm, Whenever you weave on a loom, it's a rectangle, almost no matter what you do. <laughs> so to get imagery on it, um, I stenciled and that gray piece um, is stenciled and I do not have a tapestry loom like Barbara. <laughs> and you can see about six to 12 inches of what you're working on at a time. So I made stencils out of stiff paper, card cardboardy paper, file folders actually, and cut those shapes. I stenciled the warp and then I advanced the warp um, to get those different uh, images of the birds and whatever that is at the bottom. Uh, and then that's plain weave, that's an organic cotton. Some of those yarns are kind of hard to come by, organic cotton. So this is a resist technique I use. I use boards, uh, tongue depressors, popsicle sticks and rubber bands. And this is the warp before it goes on the loom. Uh, 
I dyed this in a deep blue dye. Uh, it's a cotton warp. And the bottom picture in the middle, um, that is the warp going on my loom. And this is a loom I've had. Uh, Wayne said he was carving something in the 70s. Well, I was weaving in the 70s, but on the same loom. This loom came from Quebec. And then on the right, you see the uh, cotton fabric. Um, this is what I started weaving originally in the 70s. Everything was white, 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 uh, all natural colors. And on the left is a tapestry technique. Uh, that just means discontinuous weft. So the weft does not go all the way across the loom. And on the right, that's an insertion technique. And that is a very large pillow, so over large. Um, and the fleece, the wool fleece was about eight or nine inches long. So that's an insertion technique. Um, these are a couple things that I did on commission. You might recognize Mary Ann Rogers from um, J.R. Maxwell's. That was, um, she had a white shawl exactly like this and she wanted one in pink. So she has two now. And this gentleman on the right, George Elliott Clark, I did not meet him, but uh, there was a group of uh, these sashes that I sold um, to these people. They're Mati, uh, which is a group of actually Caribbean Native American. Um, and this shawl, the, the sash that he's wearing around his neck is to um, replicate a finger braided object. Um, and it's in wool. So that was a really nice project. He's in Toronto and he's the Poet Laureate of Canada, formerly. So was, I was very excited to learn that he got that sash. Um, I like to teach. Wayne's a teacher too. I think there's a lot of uh, things we have in common. This is at Booth Bay Railway Village. This is a little Eloise. She was just a visitor that came by and I think she would have stayed there for about 45 minutes if I'd let her if her parents let her, she was pretty excited about weaving. And this is a barn frame loom. Um, so I have a little person on a big loom and then I have big people on little looms and they're weaving that you can see what it's in the gentleman's hands. They're weaving just a narrow tape. Um, the tape would been used for all kinds of things. These tapes, these looms, uh, I'll show you an old one. Here's some more people weaving on these same looms. You might recognize Linda from Bath. I don't know who the young fellow is. This loom, uh, so this is the design of the loom. These are about three feet long and uh, decorative tape. You might've used this as a garter to hold up your socks uh, some time ago. I've seen Morris dancers wear this kind of garter. And on the right is a loom that I made. It's a replica of one that's in a museum at Bowdoin College. So I like this little fellow. Uh, I've done a lot of demonstrations at Common Ground Country Fair. And uh, this little fellow, I said, I'm always trying to encourage people to weave and he really didn't, he wasn't that interested. But he asked me if he could weave anything on the table. And I said, well, of course you could weave anything on the table thinking what was on the table but yarn. And he found the comb and this popsicle stick. And he, I think he was pretty surprised I wanted to take his picture. <laughs> and then this is another thing where here I am at Common Ground and there's so many fun things to do. I basically had to almost impress like sailors people to help me. But we wove a patterned fabric about 50 square feet. So that was a fun project. I have done that project in schools and kids love it because they're usually getting out of math class. At Common Ground, it was a whole different thing. <laughs> The enthusiasm level was very different. <laughs> so I changed. Now I'm, I'm weaving in 3D here. I decided to take this very large idea. If I weave large, lots of people can participate. And at Troy Howard Middle School, about 60 kids, some teachers and administrators helped build this twig garden structure. And we put sticks in the ground and then weave. So basically it's a waddle structure. Um, and the students prepared all this in advance. They You can see the beautiful soil that's they're going to put in there. And then I went back in September and saw this green lush object that was covered with all these edibles. So uh, well, the funny thing is on the left is in the red sweatshirt is uh, Lynn Carlin taking, a, I took a picture of her. And then at the bottom, she took a picture of me um, with the intern that helped me during the day, that was Jackie. 
So that was the hut on the day that we finished it, that little insertion photo. Um, here's a little better looking hut, I think. Um, my son Colby and I built this together. Um, he's now an architect and, and I, I had a good laugh because we've both used this in our portfolios <laughs> claiming we built it. <laughs> But that one's about, well, I think it's about 12 or 13 feet across. It's since fall, come fallen apart. These are some twig lamps. Um, when you have a lot of twigs a lot around after you've done a big weaving project, that happens. It's like, oh, I'm making lamps now. Um, the lamp on the right, that's also, that's in the window at markings. I made it three feet in diameter to fit through the door. Um, let's see what else. Oh, I. I included a lot of community projects in here. Um, I started Banners Over Bath with a de design committee of Main Street Bath. And for th the first year we had 15 people participated. And uh, the third year, I, there were 85 people involved, which I was very proud of. And I think the fourth year, I think Betsy may have been on the, may, she may have been impressed to volunteer on this project. So, that is nice of her that she was able to uh, work on that. I don't think they did anything this year. Um, my son is helping, my son, oldest son, Taylor, who's helping hang banners. That's at Front and Center Street. Um, I also teach. So these nice ladies were super, having a super good time. I, I uh, they're building a twig to tour, a three-legged object. And uh, they're using this, it's very small little hand drill and they were so excited to learn how to use this thing. I think after this class, a lot of people went out and bought hand drills. <laughs> they, I empowered them. <laughs> so I spent a week at Maine Coastal Botanical Gardens and in during the week, my sister, anybody could come help us. My sister and her husband helped me and a few other people. But within a week, I taught this class and then we also built a, about a 30 long foot a 30 foot long tunnel for, and mostly kids played in it. They wanted it very short. It was about five feet tall. So that was quite a project. And then this gentleman's got a nice uh, twig structure for his plants to climb on. Uh, I was invited to participate in altered couture and it had certain criteria. <laughs> and the first thing I made for it was this dress. And uh, the criteria was, the objects had to come from the thrift shop. And I woke up, I, I didn't know what I was going to make for it. I was invited to make, it was a fashion show and a fundraiser. And uh, I just woke up one morning after thinking about it. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to shingle a dress. And I was like, well, this is kind of cool because I've combined my, my dad is a builder. So I've combined uh, construction with uh, dress construction. And underneath that is a red silk slip. And each um, it's made of children's board books. Each one was cut about an inch and a half wide. They're all cut to the same width, but they're all different lengths. Um, and all those books came from Goodwill. Um, and of course, after I made that, my friend uh, Gary Lawless, who owns a bookstore, Gulf of Maine uh, bookstore in Brunswick, he said, Susie, you must make a book jacket. <laughs> so that's the book jacket. It's, it actually is quite wearable also. And uh, it's 60 inches wide from cuff to cuff. as a bat wing coat. Um, I, once I got working with these recycled materials, I decided to make this coffee raincoat that's child size. It's wearable. It's got a little workable pocket and magnetic closures. That one has not it's been exhibited, uh, but it hasn't, wasn't worn on the, on the runway. Uh, the middle dress uh, is worn by my, my good friend, Leah Michelle. She is in a, a dress, it says Master Pack on it. You can kind of see some of the letters. Master Pack makes packaging, enormous packaging uh, out of plastic. And I looked at their website and now you can special order anything. That, uh, plastic wrapped up uh, rolls, big rolls of fiberglass, like 15 rolls of fiberglass would come in that bag. And uh, my sister was in the middle of a big project. So she cleaned that, washed it, um, and sent it to me. So I turned it into that dress. Um, and the dress on the right has um, 
all kinds of things in it um, from Goodwill. And you might recognize um, the curtains. Those big grommets are the top of curtains. That's a pair of curtains going around Michelle's dress. <laughs> and, but the, at her waist is uh, coffee by design uh, peplum. A peplum is a little tiny short skirt that you wear at your waist. And uh, those are all different flavors of coffee by design bags. So the I've raised a, I've helped raise a lot of funds uh, for special projects, Art Van, uh, A Long Way Home, which builds buildings in South America through these projects, which I'm pretty proud of. Uh, this is a um, loom restoration project. Um, a friend of mine mentioned that they saw a loom on Facebook, and um, that people wanted to get rid of. It was in a historical society near Raymond, Maine and had all the parts. So that is the loom all put together. My husband in the middle, we, uh, this is us unpacking it. We um, washed every part, dried, we let this, it was a good sunny day, so they dried quite well. But um, on the loom are three, I don't know, I don't know if my, the view is covering them, but it had three dates on it, 1801, 1824, I guess that's a four and then 1823. So I don't know what that means. If people have an idea, I'm curious to know. Uh, but I also like, besides that it's got Arabic numerals, it has Roman numerals in the bottom corner uh, where the joins meet. And when we picked it up, I wrote on it in um, chalk, uh, not realizing it had all these nice numbers on it. Let's see, and this is for Wayne. I'm keeping plastic out of the ocean, I hope. Uh, an inflatable whale that we built uh, at the Arts Festival in Brunswick one year. Uh, this was all recycled plastic. Um, and I just wanted to include this. This is pretty fun, pretty fun event. And we inflated this with a, um, a heavy duty fan. And the kids, kids built this during the day. Um, I think the whale might be the Brunswick High School uh, mascot. So the kids wanted to make a whale, which I think was pretty successful. And that's just duct taped together. Uh, I just wanted to include this to show you um, what my son is doing because we want to work on a project together. And he goes on a walk every morning and picks up trash. And this was a little, uh, you can see it's very tiny, but we want to work on a project together. So here's our proposal drawing um, to do um, a story about uh, recreate Aesop's fable of the fox and the crow. They're having a little conversation about food. And um, I'm thinking that we would build, Alex would build the uh, fox and the crow out of trash. And then um, I would build a twig garden structure with possibly with help. We, we're collaborating and we're also gonna ask people to collaborate with us. Um, but we were talking about this project and we didn't wanna integrate any of the plastic. Like one of the things we thought was a turtle but I thought, well, with a turtle, how would we use the plastic trash or whatever trash he finds? Mostly it's plastic. Um, and we decided that we wanted it to be separated so he could easily take off his parts and they wouldn't be integrated so that my thing could go to the landfill and his could go wherever to continue on exhibit. So that's what we came up with. So that's our little, uh, we hope that happens. We hope we get to build that one day. So that is it, thank you. Thanks for looking at my slides. See if I can stop sharing now. Escape. Thank you, Susie. That was great. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? I think that you could just unmute yourselves now and just verbally ask your question. I don't think we need to use the chat for it. There's some people. Know. Well, while you're thinking of questions, I have some questions. Um, Wayne, you mentioned a whale part that you use for the eyes and the teeth. What, what is that? What, what is the... The scrim shanties use sperm whale uh, teeth to do their art and they cut them with saws and they throw the pieces away. So I take the little tiny pieces from the sperm whale teeth and turn them into sperm whale teeth. Where do you get those? 
the, I, I have a friend that used to have a scrimshaw shop in Bar Harbor and he was throwing all of his pieces away. Hmm. And um, he had since converted just to fossil ivory. He stopped buying teeth. They get to be pretty expensive and very hard to come by now. So he went co totally to fossil ivory, much of which was uh, uh, walrus and, and mastodon teeth that were found in the permafrost and turned it into his art. And uh, so he had no use for the pieces, little pieces of teeth that I got. Hmm. Good question. Anybody else have a question? I was gonna ask Wayne, it looked like I saw a porcupine quill on your, in your tools. Could that be? I don't have any porcupine quills, but you know, it's strange that you would mention that because my first year teaching, I had a pet porcupine. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> How does one pet a porcupine? With the grain. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, it was, um, it was palm sized when my father found it beside the road. And he gave it to me and I took it to school and I had it in a wire cage and I handled it with deerskin gloves and I had hall duty and I came back in and the kids had their hands in there and they were playing with them and uh, no gloves so that I no longer had to use oh. gloves. Huh. And when I actually ended the, the, the summer, I used it at summer camp too. Um, it was so big, we had to carry it around on our belly and it weighs probably uh, over 20 pounds. So it had gone from one pound to 20 pounds and I don't know how he did it on what I fed him. It was remarkable. Oh. And uh, if it didn't get attention, it would squawk, it squeak. And when we'd get, get to the camp in the morning, first thing Porky would do would start making noises. So I'd come in and give him his carrots and his dog biscuits and all that. And the kids let him out of the cage at rest period and they played with him. Um, not a real puppy, but he was, he was interesting. I had a question. I wanted to ask uh, both of you, um, so what artists sort of are sources of inspiration for you? I saw a lot of Andrew Goldsworthy and uh, your stuff, Susie. Um, oh yeah. Are there are there others that that have sort of motivated your work or whose work you admire? Oh wow, that's a good question. Well, I really kind of love hate Patrick Doherty because <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, every three months he's in a new place. Uh, building his twig garden structure. And I thought I was really a hot ticket when I got to do Coastal Maine Botanical Garden. And they had a nice red pickup truck to help us uh, harvest twigs. So I went uh, home that night and looked on the internet and I thought, oh, I wonder what Patrick Doherty's doing. Well, Patrick Doherty was in the woods um, taking pictures, he must have taken the picture of um, this beautiful, like a wooded a lane in a wooded cathedral and his twigs were being carried on a horse-drawn carriage. I was like, I can't win. <laughs> <laughs> like, yep, you outdo me again, Patrick. <laughs> what about you, Wayne? I actually have a couple of people that I mentored, a Chippy Chase, of course, from Brunswick that did those fantastic single bird sculptures out of great big pieces of wood and Hank Tyler, who was an understudy of Chippy also, and he kind of gave me a little boot in the tail when I was in graduate school to, uh, to do more carving. So the first few carvings I did were sculptures using a Dremel tool, grinding away, making uh, sandpipers. Uh -huh. And Chippy, of course, passed away a few years ago and, and Hank is still carving like crazy, but he's moved to Australia. And he posts daily on his uh, Facebook page, all of his creations. And he's not just doing birds now, he's doing abstracts out of exotic woods that come from everywhere. So um, that, th those are two of my, my heroes. Hmm. Oh, that's great. 
Anybody else with a question? Well, Susie, I have a question for you. When you're putting together, you, you were showing a photo of two women and you talked about how they learned how to use a, a, a little drill. So is how do you hold your uh, twig lamps together? Are you drilling holes and putting nails in them or? Uh, usually I, uh, I have, they were working as a team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they didn't look like they were holding that super tightly, but um, usually I use a bungee cord. I bungee cord parts together. And then um, I use a wood uh, uh, drill, a screw that is a wood for wood decks. So you're screwing them together. Okay. I just screw them. Sometimes I pre, I pilot drill. Mm -hmm. I'll get two drills and I'll pilot, I'll make pilot holes. But they have this, um, um, I'll, I'll bring one in and show you. They have a square head. It really grips really nicely. Um, and it has uh, fluting in the screw. So the wood comes out, it kind of drills a hole as it makes it. And if the wood's in good shape, that will usually work. On some of my work, if I'm trying to be more careful, I think the lamp in, I pre-drilled the holes. And your project that you want to do with your son, the, um, the crow and the fox, would you talk a little more about that? What uh, yeah, place that you were going to do it, or yeah, we uh, we've been applying online for all sorts of grants, which you rarely get. <laughs> Everybody and their brother is applying for them, but he we grew he grew up in Jamestown, Rhode Island. All three of them, and um, they have um, uh, they had a call for entry for public art with a collaborative element, and um, it was on callforentry.com cafe it's called and um so we talked about a few different things like what could we do and i was like well i build huts and you you do something totally different and we were thinking of maybe a fox in a den and i thought well people like to go into the huts so and we don't really want them his work might have uh you know it's so many parts that i didn't want people also in the same space with his structure. Also, you can see his structure if it's better on the outside. So we talked about back and forth a few times. And uh, I do love fables. And they, they don't make any sense at all, um, especially Aesop's. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, there's something about a fox. I do love the foxes. And um, Alex is, was happy to work on that project. Um, he usually does humans but he loves the figure anyway. So he's like, yeah, I can do a fox. So I was like, well, let's do a fox and a crow because there's that great story. The crows, I guess the fox admires the crow. Uh, and he says, you could, and the crow's holding food, a piece of cheese. And the, uh, the fox admires him and says, if you are, your voice is so beautiful, what would you sing? And the crow drops the food. <laughs> And that is the story. <laughs> but the, you know, the fox is supposed to be the smart one, apparently, but it's, it's a cute little story. So we hope that that will happen. I, I have no idea. But he would build, um, you know, he would do a collection. Um, he would have people collect trash, and I would have people help me weave the twig hut, if people can you know, on a very limited basis of people, a couple people at a time. Thanks. Bridget, you have a question you need to unmute yourself. Oh, you have to unmute yourself. I know I just wanted to say um, that's a great project with the fables. And if you need volunteers for weaving, I, I'm in it. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> That'd be great. I do have a project. I'm going to uh, set up a loom um, on May 1st in Westbrook. Uh, really, it's just one person weaving, but um, I am going to demonstrate and it's free demonstration. I don't know where you live, but um, I, was, I invite people if they have questions about warping their loom, they can pick my brain on that day. I should be, it's a community center. I should be there all day. Right. 
Anyone else? Well, thank you all for coming and thank you, Roberta and Patton Library for hosting us. It was really wonderful to put this all together. Um, if you want to see Susie's work in person or Wayne's work in person or a myriad of other artists, please come down to Markings Gallery. We'd love to see you there. And um, we're going to be doing another artist talk at the top, well, via Zoom through Topsom Library in May. And you can see the dates and sign up for that soon on our website. And somebody is asking a question in yes. the chat box. Yes, somebody wants to know when Wayne's class is starting again. I'm waiting for the daily numbers to get down from these 500 and 400s to whatever. So <laughs> I, I'm thinking maybe in a couple of weeks we'll begin to start classes again. Well, I guess that's it. All right. Well, I thank, thank you so much to everyone for coming and thank you, Barbara, for organizing and for the idea. And thanks to Wayne and Susie for um, putting together presentations. And thank yeah, you. Thanks for, thanks. thanks for the opportunity. Great. Thank you for making this work, Wayne and Susie and Roberta. <laughs> and yeah, we'll, uh, yes, we'll make our recording well. available soon. So um, you can look for it either on our website, the library website or the Markings Gallery website. All right. yes, Thanks so much. Farewell. About it. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Have a good Bye. day. Thank Farewell. You.